I'm going to uh, take us to the other side of the looking glass and talk about the burqa ban legislation, controversies around it, that is currently in place in parts of the European Union. And I'm going to speak from a particular sensibility in a particular position, namely a white so-called liberal. That means many things in many settings, but let's just use the word critical liberal woman who was confronted with the fact that uh, for the first time I had to really think about the implications of the burqa ban when you just didn't feel comfortable about any legislation from anywhere that tells women what they may or may not wear. Okay, so that's my positioning for this paper. So let's begin. Veil dressing and the gender geopolitics of what not to wear. In the wake of 9-11, the plight of women in, in Afghanistan under Taliban rule, forced to wear the burqa, denied schooling, and subjected to other repressive measures, was a major theme in Western news media and academe. In the ensuing decade, the burqa, along with other forms of Muslim veil dressing, veil dressing being the term that Emma Talo uh, uses to great effect, <coughs> has become a bone of contention in Western Europe. The perception that there are more visibly veiled women now appearing in public has been greeted with hostility in public opinion polls and news reports, despite the relatively small proportion of women in these countries actually wearing the full burqa, 0.002% or something. Several European countries nevertheless have passed legislation or are about to or have put it on the books. The, the, the status of the legislation is still an open-ended question. Uh, to ban Muslim veil dressing, and here I'm using the term in a more general way, in public places, France, the Netherlands, and Belgium, which has been the <coughs> pioneering place in particular. Now the thing is, what we see here is, despite what you feel about <coughs> Taliban rule in Afghanistan, on the streets of Brussels, Amsterdam, or Paris, and London, by the way, now I'm noticing these things more, veil dressing that covers the whole body in some form or other, head to toe, face and or hands, has become the focus for expressions of unease, disgust, or fear about Muslim women, and I quote, expressing cultural difference, unquote, in such a visible way. What I'm arguing is burqa ban legislation is the latest wave of measures targeting Muslim populations in an, an increasingly overt anti-immigrant discourse in Europe. Anti-immigrant becoming synonymous now with anti-Muslim, particularly in media, popular media, academic media, and more and more in political debates. And what really concerns me is that the core element of extreme right-wing populist political programs is the burqa ban. And please, don't, I cannot emphasize this enough. I cannot emphasize this enough, and it's great to be speaking about this in the States. The point is that Muslim women's bodies, however they're dressed, and how they're dressed particularly, now bear the brunt of a more generalized anxiety about the viability of the larger European Union project as one of, or was one, of cultural, as well as was, <laughs> one of economic integration. As veiled Muslim women become to represent the, I quote again, forbidden modern, making herself at home in the heartland of secularly Christian Europe, they are seen as the incarnation, mosque minarets, the architectural evidence of the limits to multiculturalism, the limits to multiculturalism. Veils, religious, meaning Islamic, no other form of religious fundamentalism, and terrorist acts have become inseparable from one another in the popular imaginary, liquefiers of the larger European project of modernity, and thereby posing a palpable threat to public order and the cultural integrity of the EU. And I'm actually almost quoting directly from party um, manifestos here, more or less. <laughs> now, more acutely, I get really upset when I talk about this. <laughs> At the right end of the spectrum, visibly Muslim women represent what populist politicians call the Islamification of Europe. Ban the burqa, how the, this is how the argument goes, impose more restrictive immigration policies, the two always together, and this cultural erosion, this erosion of European norms and values can be held in check, sort of paraphrase, quote, unquote. The point is, caught in the middle of all this is us, critical theorists, feminists, non-Muslim women, Muslim women, women from the global north, women from the global south, and our male or not male partners. What do you do? You either are for or against the burqa ban. There is no in between. And this is the kind of paradox I'm dealing with. And I think this young artist, Sarah Maple, who's based in the UK in London, who is brought up Muslim herself but comes from mixed um, uh, parentage, um, puts it so well that I almost have nothing more to say. I'll just let her slides roll on. 
Anyway, what I want to do in this paper, and I'm going to try and work this through today, this afternoon, right at the end of the day, is that I'm trying to make a juxtaposition. I think there's a parallel, which is even more disturbing, and that parallel is between the kinds of socialisation and the forms of forbidding that come from popular TV makeover shows, mm -hmm. and in particular, what not to wear, which I did used to love, by the way, so I'm <laughs> guilty pleasure, guilty pleasure. Okay. Um, and of course, a whole uh, range of feminists, particularly Angela McRobbie, um, a colleague of mine, you know, very important interventions in what she calls the post-feminist problem. And she notes that these kinds of makeover shows are part of a pornification of increasingly younger female bodies. Now, whatever you might think about that, of course, others have noticed that there's an intersection between the pairing of this consumerism and political disengagement in a post-feminist age. I assume these, these slides are just going, yeah. Okay, great, so you can giggle away. Okay, in both cases, the critics of the burqa ban or critics of burqa wearing, you see this is the problem we're in, both you can be critical about and get away with being critical. In both cases, also of reality shows and what not to wear. Critics point out how measures of success, cultural integration and social mobility respectively, rest on a docile, namely female subject, acquiescing to, indeed embracing a particular set of cultural practices, dress codes and behavioural norms. Yet in both cases, the forces of individual agency trouble more determinist arguments, I would try and argue. Transgression takes place by subjects either refusing to dress up or dress down, veil up, veil off. Uh, by doing the reverse to what is expected or decreed by law or custom. The point is from a sort of European discourse and a move to the right and, intoler and increasing intolerance is that the subtext in both cases is that we see one set of cultural codes looking to enforce its norms and values on another through overt but also covert forms of persuasion and coercion. It's very easy to look at laws that coerce. They're shocking. But what about the more the more covert forms of persuasion. And this is where Angela McRobbie notes what not to wear. Anyway, I go through a number of things in the paper and I'm gonna run through as many as I can without hurrying too much. Now the thing is, um, there's many forms of veil dressing. There's the niqab, there's the hijab, there's the full burqa, even the burqa itself has many forms and colors. The idea of the black burqa is a particular representation that's gained a huge foothold in the West. And the whole paper could be just about these, these subtleties, the fabrics. We had a lot of that last year in the panels, which was very, very interesting. I have no time to deal on that. Um, but the point is for their opponents, particularly in Europe, and this is like well-meaning, well-educated, not right-wing voting people who don't like the burqa, feel very, very upset about it, is the hijab, the headscarf, and the burqa now synonymous. Um, equally fashionable headscarves become indistinguishable in this discourse and these, these expressions I hear every day from the overtly political implications of, and I quote again, the ugly and disgusting burqa or chador. Where these garments are illegal, they're going to be illegal in Belgium. They are, in fact, illegal in Belgium. So what do you do? Take your scarf off before you get on the bus. Be told to go home and take your hijab off before you can work at the cash out. Face being fired. All of these are happening. And of course, they happen in different ways in different parts of Europe. Once they're on the law books, things can be done, just like a law against trousers can be used or not used, enforced or not enforced. The thing is, the tricky thing I try to do with the paper is always too much, but hey, why not? Is that there's a form of counter-hegemonic resistance that I think Tarlow's work shows without perhaps overtly talking about the political, is that young women, of course, are also wearing hijab and various forms of veil dressing, but they're also consumers. They're also fashionable. They're also, part, they're also taking part in the media and beauty trends, but they're doing from more than one cultural source. They're an enormously growing market, as some of you may know already, particularly in online fashion. And here, modest dressing from Jewish communities, we know from uh, Christian communities, Amish women and Muslim women go on the same websites. I think you know this. I'm speaking to the converted here. But what's going on in the politics? Well, the politics is where it gets really scary. And um, the simple argument is this is a double standard. Yes, it is a double standard. But the double standard we're all wearing. We're all wearing it. And this is what it actually is about. Danielle Bacalen, who is the Belgian politician who first proposed the law in Belgium, his argument is like this. And I quote him, we cannot allow someone to claim the right to look at others without being seen. So I just refer you to, ah, oh, what a brilliant piece of timing. Um, wearing the burqa in public is not compatible with an open, liberal, tolerant society. 
Now I'm going to cut to Trini Woodrall, who's from Trini and Suzanne and whatnot, to where you all know who they are. You know, big stars and Oprah. Mm -hmm. Trini's saying this on, uh, on a website. She said, you can tell she's the outdoors type who doesn't pay much attention to makeup and grooming. Her Brillo pad hair looks like it's been done with pinking shears. It has no shine or shape. Then she goes on to talk about the woman's bust and uh, how she shouldn't wear um, floppy pullovers and quite funny, quite innocuous, quite innocent. But this juxtaposition to me makes me think things slightly differently. What I do in the paper, and I won't go into um, too much detail right now, is my linking device, because this is an odd kind of juxtaposition, it's not one I can argue, I'm just doing it, I'm putting them together. Burka band debates, what not to wear, and I'm trying to see them in the same kind of frame. And I link them up with a, a rather odd play, it's odd because it's odd in his larger oeuvre as well, and that's the play Salome from Oscar Wilde. And in Salome, the veil plays a central role. And if you've been in any productions, as I have, the best bit about the play is how you're going to stage the dance that Salome does in order to get her wish. And her wish, if you know the biblical story, is to get the head of John the Baptist. Why? Because he doesn't return her advances. Okay. Now, this play is only an hour long, about 25 pages long. Salome is a main character. There's all sorts of hot stuff, incest, desire, necrophilia, sexual lust. And the veil, of course, in a very sort of orientalist way, uh, represents the sort of the body naked, the body covered, the oriental desire, and all these sorts of things. Um, and I sort of think about that in terms of ways to um, think about how could Bakalan talk like this and not even notice the own double standard. Mm -hmm. There is a geopolitics there, but this has been going on for some time because the burqa ban is such banning the burqa ostensibly. It's been around for quite a few years. For instance, in France, um, women have been denied naturalization or citizenship on the basis of how veiled up they are. And if they're too veiled, they don't get naturalization because it indicates by some rulings that they're not integrated enough. And this whole issue about cultural integration is, is part of the larger story. There have also been precedents in the Netherlands and in Germany and in France where young women who, were, who are wearing hijab get told to take it off and they say, no, we're not. And they say that's because it's my cultural religious right to wear it. The French story says, no, we are in a, um, we are in a secular society. A laïcité is a very important part of the French constitution. You must take it off anyway. Um, either they take it to court, or in the case of two Dutch high school pupils, they won their case at the, in the Netherlands Anti-Discrimination Commission in 2003. They were allowed to go to class wearing hijab. So we've moved far away from the burqa. We're now looking at headscarves, any sort of headscarf. Okay, just before I get into what not to wear, because I love to talk about this show, is um, I want to think about uh, theoretically, of course, post-colonial, particularly feminist post-colonial scholars, have talked about the veil. They've theorized the veil in a more abstract way, um, uh, understanding that, of course, as uh, Yeganoglu notes, that the veil is one of these tropes through which Western fantasies of penetration into the mysteries of the Orient and access to the interiority of the other are phantasmatically achieved. Well, these are phantasmatically um, subverted, I think, in Sarah Maple's mm -hmm. work. And hopefully that loop's going to keep going. It should do, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, as she's noting and reminding us, um, if we care to think about our own feelings, if I can say us, <laughs> your own feelings about seeing a woman in a niqab or a burqa, and I think everyone has a feeling, is that there's a tropology at stake. And the veil is not simply a signifier of cultural identity or religious persuasion that can be liked or disliked, be good or bad. For the European gaze, it signifies a production of an exteriority, a target or a threat. So this has been happening long before 9-11 gave um, impetus to these um, legislative moves. Another thing I want to bring in theoretically, just to sort of titillate us here, is Sarah Ahmed's work, again a colleague, I'm very lucky at Goldsmiths, is Sarah Ahmed argues in her famous book that of course bodies, physical bodies and social space meet in physical and symbolic terms. And she says a number of profound things which I think are relevant to what I'm trying to say. The shape of the skin, as she calls it, and then she talks about the skin of the community. So if you think about a woman veil dressing, whether she could be um, a religious Jewish woman, could be an Amish woman, any or um, um, what's it, Hari Krishna devotee, the shape of that skin and the skin of that community somehow seem to be identified all the same as what someone is wearing. But that's almost too simple, because in fact it could be both. There are many complex layers of meeting and discontinuity. 
Um, and our feelings about what we see isn't just whether you like what someone's wearing. The deep disgust that some people express in the public media and to myself as I've given this paper around the world is that they can't get a grip how someone would cover themselves up in such a way. And they take it very personally. The disgust is a very personal <coughs> disgust. And I'm thinking, well, yeah. Would you express that disgust about the size or shape of someone's skinny jeans? No, we seem to reserve the right to judge this kind of dressing in ways that we would not others. Okay, so um, I go on then in the paper a bit about distinctions for the reader because not everybody understands the differences. Why should they? It's not um, that common to understand the subtleties between what kind of veiling um, is where. Okay, and then I talk about, as we obviously know in this audience, that uh, just as Linda's paper shows us, that burqa bans are the flip side, of course, to enforced veiled wearing in Afghanistan. And what we in the West tend to do is go, look, bad Afghanistan, good West. Uh, the excuse in Europe is that what's going on in Afghanistan is not, or, or in um, Iran, for instance, the fact that women have to wear um, various forms of veiled dressing. Somehow in the debates in Europe, this has no traction at all. No traction at all. It's, uh, it's extraordinary. It just doesn't go anywhere when somebody says, well, have you noticed that what you're doing is the same as what they do in Afghanistan? And just, just water off a duck's back. So let's move to the shows. Right, OK. This is where I transgress, I've been told. But never mind, I do think there is a parallel. I hope you'll agree when I've talked you through. What does Susanna and Trini do? Just to remind you all, she gets the participants, willing victims, to stand in front of a mirror, 360 degrees. Remember, they go into the room, and everybody goes, <gasps> <laughs> and these women, I don't know why, well, so every so often a man um, stand in their underwear, not Victoria's Secret, usually it's not a particularly pretty set of underwear, mm -hmm. and they're told what their body shape is, what style they should wear, um, whether they're being, you know, that we all laugh at they're out of date and they're very 80s wardrobes in one case I remember. And then they're followed by cameras and they embark on these shopping expeditions, expeditions as you know, and then Trini and Susanna would jump out from behind the clothing racks and go, yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> Terribly funny and very compelling viewing. And I have to say Angela didn't get the joke and she was right not to. Because what she noticed, I don't know if she noticed at the same time I did, but of course gradually there was a hypersexualized trope started to take over and it all became about flat tummies and push-up bras and a certain form of dressing was being imposed on these women. It took a high, um, a high profile personality to assert her body to fit, clothes to fit her body for us to realize just how they were imposing a particular form of dress. And of course this isn't legislation. These women are volunteers. This is fashion, this is fun, this is reality TV, don't take it too seriously, but we all know how seriously we watch these shows. I'm not the only one, surely. Yeah, like you all know that a certain body shape looks better in a certain cut. Yeah, I mean, these are basic rules. This show is as old as the hills. I mean, there's one that used to be called How to Look Good. So that brings me to my second show. Trini and Susanna kind of went out of fashion, quite literally. They got a bit over the top, a bit too full of themselves. And another show emerged called How to Look Good Naked. And to me, this is the show that really intersects with the whole veil dressing and the, the erotics and the, the anti-erotics of the debates. By, um, hosted by British Chinese presenter Gok Wan, who's gone from strength to strength. He's on his about his fifth or sixth rendition. He's now looking at teenagers. It's a whole different text, whole different script. Point about Gok is he's camp, he's Asian, he's every girl's best friend, and he uses earnestness. And what he does is he teaches women of a certain body shape, of a certain age, he teaches them how to look good naked. You have to learn how to look good naked. And the whole climax of the show, has it hit America yet? Maybe not. Is that he sets it up and they, they get a proper photo shoot, right? You know, and they get told to undress. And of course, I'm living in the Netherlands watching this where they would actually undress. <laughs> but this is the UK. So they kind of sort of do this. Like that. <laughs> and they get things draped. They get draped in veils. They get draped in effectively Salome type. If you were producing Salome from Oscar Wilde, you dress these women similarly. The climax is a big, always in a shopping centre in England. Note the shopping centre, note the political economy before you give me that question. <laughs> big thing about shopping. And then they're unveiled. The, this huge screen, the size of that wall is unveiled of this woman naked, looking good. <laughs> Yoo-hoo! They all wave. Yeah. Uh, naked itself, nakedness itself requires intervention. 
So there's little room for nuances in popular makeover TV. That's not what it's about. It's not about nuance. But if you have to learn to look good naked in a post-feminist Western setting, what is wrong with this picture? The thing about Gok Wan, why he is also compelling viewing, is that he's very effective because his discourse is to install, instill confidence in women who feel bad about their bodies. He's kind of like a reality TV version of the, the tonic to Lily's point about anorexia because he deliberately chooses women who are not particularly skinny. It is kind of empowering and it is very compelling. It's not what not to wear, it's how to look good naked. But see, this is the flip side. We're living in Western Europe in a post-feminist uh, setting, which in a post-feminist setting, differently from what Robbie wants to say, namely that to undress is a form of liberation. That's what women did in the 60s. They flung off their clothes. Burn your bra. Don't shave your legs. Be, let it all hang out. That's liberation. So any woman covering up in a feminist sensibility is despite our best efforts to be inclusive and, and, and pluralistic, for most many feminists this is a problem. It looks countercultural, counter-revolutionary. Okay. Let me just pause for a minute. Okay, and what we also forget is that when we link up the Burke ban with anthropological studies of how women dress within veil dressing cultures, of course, with the Burke ban discourses, we see nothing about the nuances, the fashion lines that um, Lily was mentioning. The fact that even the hijab is worn in different ways, how much you cover the chin, how far down it is, whether you, whether you cover your eyebrow, um, the fabrics you choose, the colors you choose. And the thing, particularly in the Netherlands, is there's whole fashion lines for Moroccan fashion. And using all sorts of um, forms of Arab dress, but particularly, particularly using the veil dressing um, motifs. So what I'm wearing now, I did it, what I actually deliberately wear when I give this talk is what a young uh, second, third generation Moroccan or Turkish woman in Amsterdam would wear. The only difference would be that she would be wearing a hijab. But it, she'd be wearing the skinny jeans and their shoes are to die for. So the whole kind of uh, stereotyping and um, excessiveness of the burqa ban debates are a complete contradistinction to what's actually happening on the streets in Belgium, Amsterdam or London. The trouble is that those who are being targeted by the Burqa ban are women, recent migrants, women from the Sudan, women from Somalia, or women from communities who have, in the case of my neighbours in Amsterdam, started to veil up because things have become polarised. So women are taking on the veil, and this is adding another layer. Uh, particularly in London, this is a much more uh, vociferous uh, vocalization of young women saying, I choose to wear the veil, it is my choice. So we have an awkward issue about liberal models of choice and individualism intersecting with capitalism, exploitations of choice and desire and buying, all mixed up in a big mashup of uh, fears of the veiled other, fears of the veiled other. So to finish off, she's still rolling through, I just love this one. <laughs> The critical conundrum in my paper, that's the title of my last section, is for people in my position uh, to find yourself as a feminist siding with some of the most frighteningly right-wing political voices in Europe at the moment is a very unpleasant feeling. I hadn't really thought about whether I liked the Burke or not. You know, I took a kind of feminist passive line, yeah, well, you know, uh, mm. But the minute I discussed it, I got told I was being a pinko libo and um, a Afghanistan sympath sympathizer from people quite close to me, very difficult. The point is, as a lot of uh, scholars from Turkey, from Morocco, post-colonial post and feminist note, there's an issue with the gays. And the whole thing about the Salome play, it's all about the gays. The whole transgression of Salome is her gaze. I hope you know the one where the ones I love orgasm, that one. It's about the gays looking back. And the trouble for a lot of white Western European men and women is they are scared of the gaze because what do these forms of dress do? They emphasize the eyes. The eyes are what you see. So as some, a theorist called Gürler talks about, she talked about a, an incident in the Turkish parliament where a woman turned up wearing hijab. Now in the Turkish context, context is everything. This was horrific. This was completely forbidden because they are a secular society, so you don't, as a politician, you know, a member of parliament, wear the hijab. So this huge controversy Gola talks about, and she talks about forbidden moderns. And her point is that we analysts need to defamiliarize our gaze and go back between micro and macro levels of analysis. 
that's her point. So the anthropological, sociological edge, I do want to keep in the picture, along with the more structural geopolitical readings. I think the juxtaposition is where, for me, the politics lie, the unbundling. Um, it's not just about traditional versus modern, oppressed versus liberated, young versus old, suitably versus unsuitably dressed. That's the first sort of conundrum. How do you get out of your own language of dichotomies? We can't. Now, a young um, friend of mine, when she first, she read the first version of this paper, and she said, oh, yes, what not to wear. She's American, uh, well, brought up in America. She said, uh, yeah, my mother told me I should watch that show. <laughs> I looked at her, she dresses impeccably. I said, why? She said, I don't think my mother thinks the way I dress is very fashionable. Note the mother telling the daughter to watch the show. So my first point is we, I'm talking about we um, critical scholars and of whatever hue or religious um, persuasion or cultural background, if we take fashion, which we are today, so I don't, I'll forget about the if, the fact we're taking fashion, <laughs> ways of dressing and practices of embodied adornment, veiled or not, if we take them as a rich vein of inquiry for scholars to engage crucial issues of our time, and to do so, though, with the understanding that this is because such issues are infused with the social, the cultural, and the aesthetic dimensions that reach and get under the skin, quite literally, and behind the veil, quite symbolically, then it's not so large a step to reflect on how these cross currents around veil dressing present a number of conceptual and political challenges. And I, I go on to talk about some of those, which I think I won't today. I've made the paper, an earlier, more angry version of this paper available at, at, through the Goldsmiths, um, what's it called, Goldsmiths Research Online. I'll check it's live, so if you want to read the extended argument, you may go. But can we get past uh, positioning veiled women as victims of structural violence? Can we get past positioning veiled women, by choice or not, as empty vessels uh, for unveiling women in order to make them modern? So that either way, we're positioning women as passive or um, structurally positioned that they have no choice. Um, how we, particularly people who talk to me about the burqa or all, the niqab particularly, and the hijab as well in the Europe is becoming unacceptable. And it's been around for generations. The fact that young women in France or Germany or Holland wear it very fashionably has become problematic for them. I saw a young woman arriving actually in New York when I did at Homeland Security and she had, oh, I was, I'm really looking at her, beautifully and she had it quite high up. Sometimes you get it quite high up, okay? And you could see him insisting that she basically move it and that just her gestures of discomfort, of being asked to literally quasi undress and she carefully moved it away and pushed it back. But the pushing back, I could tell from her body language, made her feel very uncomfortable. I mean, what would you feel like if you were asked to undress in the way we understand undressing at the border control in New York? What would you feel? Wouldn't feel too good, would you? So on a very personal level, I want to finish with this issue by actually saying that the real question mark for me from, an, from breaking these ideas open and really not just going, it's bad, it's good, or it's not bad, or it's not good, and not just um, diving into a cultural relativist position, because it's a weak argument in Europe at the moment. It's a, it's a non-argument, it's, it's just not a starter, guys. Don't even start with cultural relativism. It is a hardening debate in Europe. You have to come up with some real ammunition. Um, and I've decided to say it's absolutely wrong to ban the burqa. It's absolutely illegal, immoral, and against human rights. And there's no, to me, there is no in-between position as there was after writing this paper, because thinking about what not to wear as a show, what would happen, this is my last thought, to Western discomforts with veil, West, veil dressing today, if the wealth of knowledge and more attuned, more accommodating gazes on the intricacies of veil dressing, in its own right, in its own right, to meet the gaze coming from behind the veil, would, could be brought to bear on legitimate concerns, particularly from feminists like McRobbie and others, about the formative power of shows like What Not to Wear and its spin-offs, which of course inculcate a certain form of body, a certain form of look that is not always liberating. Can the practices and fashions of veil dressing and or modest dressing inform the dressing and undressing aspirations of audiences religiously following the advice of fashion arbiters like Trini, Susanna, Gokwan, Pod from another ghastly show called Snog, Marry or Avoid, and even Oprah Winfrey on primetime television. My thought is, should there be a law against these sorts of violent undressings? Thank you.
Thanks, a great way to end. I think we should allow um, some time for questions for Marianne, and then we'd like to open up the conversation. If you don't want to stay for the um, open conversation, which is basically trying to just pull out some shared interests and themes which we might carry forward to a conference next year. Your reward for staying, if you need one, is that we will have drinks at 6 p.m., but you've got to wait <laughs> and go to another building. Um, but let's start with any questions directly for Marianne about the issues that she raised in her paper. I thought it was too tired. Yeah. <laughs> Marianne, fantastic bit. Thank you very much. Um, but I'm puzzled about sort of your last one. <laughs> I, I think it's just a, probably just a throwaway comment. No, no. Go on. You want to? I agree with you, obviously. Um, I agree with you in terms of the violence that's being done, in the debate that's being had in Europe about the work. Then why say that these things? You know, we should think about legally banning these programs. So that's what one thing. And the second thing uh, which I, I feel very strongly about is that, um, and you're quite right to point that out, that we are not listening to the arguments anymore, in a way. Um, so what we end up doing is representing uh, sort of ever hardening positions. So to give you a very personal example of what I mean by listening. Mm. Um, I was teaching a class in the UK on gender development and we had an election for some reason, I can't remember now, within among our students. And they were supposed to not election, it was we had to pick something, you know, out of a hat or something. There were no hats in the class. So I was wearing my dupatta <laughs> because I was wearing a shawar for me, so I was had a dupatta. So I took one end of it, and I said, okay, this could be the hat. So put your things down. And my colleague, who's, who writes on post-colonial theory, and uh, you know, she said, no, give it to me. And she tried to take my dupatta away. And I said, no, that makes me uncomfortable, because this dress requires me to wear, you know, the dress requires me to wear, not any kind of culture. Um, it's one, one bit of it is fine, because we can do it. I can just move around. Oh, come on, don't be silly. Right? Mm. I was a young lecturer at that time, and she was a senior person. And I have never forgotten it, because for me, it was not about law. Mm. It was not about any of these kind of hard things. But it was about listening mm. to what I was saying. And I think very often, even in the performative debates that we have, we forget about that, you know, or not forget, but we don't focus on reception. And we don't focus on listening. So it is the right to speak or the right to present ourselves. But as your paper suggests, mm -hmm. when the gaze is turned, mm -hmm. the discomfort. So I think in a way to bring that into a mix, I was just thinking about that when you were talking. So very, very thoughtful paper. Thank you. Know, thank you, Sharon, because you're not the only one to share on that level. Um, when I gave this paper, I gave this paper in New Zealand and the room was packed uh, with a number of women from a number of parts of the world. And I was, oh boy. There were very polarised opinions. Um, right at the end, <coughs> after it's all over, there's an older woman, I, you know, let's say, you know, the sort of, um, what you call it, second wave feminist generation, and she wanted to know, she was puzzled, she asked me. She did, my paper hadn't helped her at all, hadn't answered her question. I just, you know, she wanted to know why women dress like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, so I thought, well, who? So I thought, okay, and I asked her why, what was, you know, I just sort of pro I probed a bit more, and then apparently, uh, she gets a physical feeling of fear and disgust when she sees a woman veiled, and she didn't specify. Cause, so there's all sorts of media representations, and that's why I think Maple's work is so powerful, because, I mean, this is so subversive. You know, the I love orgasm, you know, I mean, the sort of desexualization and, yeah. So those sorts of stories come up all the time, and this it isn't just listening, though, Shuin, it's that people can't even see can't even see. This is a sort of a blindness as well. But my point is slightly different there. It's not about people can't see. It's about when we theorize, sometimes we don't listen enough to. So the, po the other polarization, as you know, mm. very much is about FGM, right? Oh, now, yes, I've yes. had so yeah. many 
you know, yeah. that is even you know far more polarizing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And yet, <coughs> a massive argument with someone in 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 a in a session like this, where I said, well, look to the ground. There are struggles going on in the Sudan, in here, in you. You think you know, there's that whole thing about rescue, the yeah. rescue, yeah. Yeah. and you're not listening to these women who are saying. Hey, you know, we are either bailing up or we are fighting FGM, but we are fighting it in a different way to maybe the way you are fighting. And so, how do we build that into a theorization? Is the challenge for me? Yeah, and I it's agree. It's not an easy. No, it's not. I agree, Sharon. I think for me, this paper is very much almost like, excuse the expression, veil dressing for dummies, because you know, like you know, computing for dummies. This idea that there are some first bases you've got to make. Um, I've been accused of being disingenuous, of being non-scholarly. I've been some terrible things have been said of not understanding European politics <laughs> <laughs> by someone who'd visited Switzerland for two weeks. <laughs> That's a cheap throwaway. No, it's not a throwaway. It's a throwaway line. That was a cheap throwaway line. But this last line, I feel, is slightly ironic because the debates in Europe are not over yet. The, it's on the law books, but police officers in Amsterdam are saying publicly they're not going to enforce it. Mm -hmm. Now, no, cops and cops in Amsterdam are a special breed. You know, they really are the, the sexiest police force on the planet. <laughs> this is a police force that allows their gay officers to look very gay, to have pierced ears. I mean, they're really cool. But this is a very straight up, you know, standard um, leader, you know, commission or whatever they call them. He said, I'm not going to bother. There are more things to worry about. So the thing in Holland, this is a kind of like, we let our girls wear every girl on the checkout, and they're girls, they're 17, on the checkout at all the big supermarkets in Amsterdam are wearing hijab. But in Belgium, they are fired. Germany is a whole set of other debates because there are slightly different laws about who, who cannot wear veils, and France is another set of debates. So of course it's all the subtleties um, involved in the specifics within Europe. So it wasn't a throwaway line, it's just I wanted to leave it open. Mm -hmm. The idea, if you're considering legalizing what women should or should not wear, then where do you draw the line here? So maybe I'll take it out, but, but theorizing, I agree, it's very difficult. And Andreas? Yeah, um, one objection, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Europe isn't Europe as, as a monolith. You have no, 27 no. countries within the European Union alone, so that there's different attitudes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And as you rightly pointed out, there's, there's points of a little bit of a resistance. I uh, mentioned a guy in Amsterdam who said, I can put anything in the box, I can kill them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The police has other things to do. So there, there's a counter that's all moving. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that the law can, cannot actually do what it's supposed to do, you know, regulate our interactions. I think we need to drop us out a lot of that too. So I admit to a certain level of discomfort seeing somebody dressed like this. Do I expect the law therefore to ban it because I feel discomfort about this? Could drop, I mean, the, the books would be this fact of anything that I feel uncomfortable <laughs> about would be banned. Um, so no, I'm actually, I find this completely not. But isn't that, in a sense, let me throw this back at you, got sort of a solution to this? Let's stop making sense. Let, let's stop make, taking this seriously. Isn't what I've done, in a sense, sort of the, 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 the response to this? Let them dress any which way they want. Let's appreciate the yeah. well, like ever style that they put into this kind of stuff. Shouldn't we sort of aestheticize the whole thing and then depoliticize it? Yeah, now that's where it gets tricky, because the minute you bring in media studies in terms of, which is where McRobbie's made her point, the minute you bring in reality shows, and the way perceptions are molded by media images. Um, the thing is, Gok did start off not taking himself too seriously, but now he takes himself very seriously. Correct. Yeah. Um, it's the nature of the kind of media machine that kind of uh, starts to become a character of itself. I uh, yeah. I mean. Do we, do we know if all the, uh, the viewers take him seriously? I don't. Uh, I Again, think. Yeah. There, there, there seems to be a little bit of an over-determination. Perhaps, yes, I do go into one of the versions of the paper. I talk about, you know, we need to understand that people don't just consume messages Precisely. the same way. Um, I'm sure there are shows, I don't know, somebody can tell me, in parts of the world there might there will be uh, veil-dressing versions of what not to wear, I'm sure. And if there aren't, I'm sure it won't be long before they come. You know, what not to wear veiled. And, um, <coughs> but you only have to start looking. I think listening and looking is important because I now look in a different way from the study I've had to do for this paper. Um, I look very differently and I'm... Yeah, and I, I just, my last anecdote is, um, I was in Vienna last summer giving a paper about something else entirely and one of my colleagues, um, Golam Kirbani, who's just written this great book about Blogistan, Iran and the internet, 
Um, Gollum and I were down, down near the palace in Vienna, you might, a hot summer's night, and then the rain, phew, down. And I had a flimsy scarf, you know, and it was pouring. It was pouring. So what did I do? I just did this, <laughs> as you would. Now, Gollum, see how I, ch how, how I change? Politically, if I'd started like this, you would have got really scared, I reckon. <laughs> anyway, Gollum, of course, is um, Iranian, and he's got a lovely big moustache. We were running along, it was pouring with rain, and I happened to be behind him. I just happened, and the looks I got, you have no idea. <laughs> then I suddenly felt what it was like, and there's, um, the Guardian had, I won't quote it, the Guardian had a little, they have a little secret column, secret thoughts, mm -hmm. and this was a secret thought of a veiled woman, and she mentions this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a double, yeah. I think we have to start with the experiential first, and then theorise our way out of it. I think we try and theorise our way in. Mm -hmm. I think we need to start with the anthropological, the phenomenological, mm -hmm. and theorise our way out of it. To me, that's the political action we can make. We need to keep it specific. So we don't call Europe Europe when it's basically just this crazy Benelux part of the world of Europe. But uh, they have their own reasons for burqa bans. It's got nothing to do with the burqa. Mm -hmm. This right-wing move is about getting a certain legislation on the book that <coughs> represents the thin edge of the West to get rid of anyone who is not white, Christian, European. It's an anti-immigrant, anti-migrant move. They don't care about the burqa. They do, but you know they know that these laws are symbolic. But once something is on the law books, there's an issue, there's a problem. Laws can be enforced. So I'm very, very sceptical and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and what's the word, pessimistic about what this means. And Otto, mm -hmm. Sorry, can, I give you, on, can, can I give you the last question? And then Lily, maybe we should just broaden the conversation to pull out some themes, but why not have a final question? I'm just curious if it would be possible to think about it also, I mean, in the ban against hoodies in shopping malls mm -hmm. in England and so on, that, you know, do we think that certain garments are contagious in the sense that they cause effects among other people? So if, two, if there are three people wearing hoodies, they actually spread criminality around them, like the sort of the broken glass. Yeah, the broken windows. The broken, sort of broken window, yeah. so that, that you know, it creates sort of an atmosphere where more and more people will feel that it's right to do something. And I'm just sort of curious, I have this experience in the metro in Paris when the, when the police was coming on the metro, and there were a gang of eight of them dressed up like military, you know, and uh, that also happens all over Europe too, that the military dress turns from, oh, sorry, police dress turns from sort of public servant to uh, sort of militarized. Mm -hmm. And you don't, add, you actually feel more scared with these police around, looking like they're up for, for some civil war, than I felt before they were around. And I'm just curious how, how you know, if there's some certain, you know, spread of effects or whatever we call that, sort of that, that sort of twist certain milieus or something into, you know, uh, and is that sort of what we're also sort of scared of? Because I, I feel that the hoodie ban it resonates very well mm. with some sort of scare of that, that some things might spread, you know, some, some, some behavior yeah. stuff. Yeah, because women, women wearing niqab or burqa are starting to, you know, 0.002% or 0.2%. They are very visible because they stand out. But as the Dutch, um, oh, I'll, let, I'll let Piet Hein Donner have the last word, innocently said, he said, of course we're going to ban things like hood, I think hoodies or burgers because we don't let people walk around naked in the streets. <laughs> so think about what he's saying. It's wrong to walk around, but they do actually in Amsterdam. You are allowed to go naked and you look good. <laughs> you should be watching Yok Gok. But the thing is, he's saying that these odd kind, no, it's something... It's about vi the visibility of fear, the politics of visibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think, can I be honest? Yeah. I, I think it's a, bit, uh, it's a bit more than the visibility of fear. I think it's also the anxiety that somebody who dresses differently from you can have a different way of entering into the society. You know, and, have, and, and engaging or, you know, embodying that society. So I think it's, it, it's more a question of like, uh, you know, when you come together as a group, you can articulate a very different political position than what is expected already within the space. So it's anxiety also about the you know the disruption of dominant narratives or dominant ways of being. I don't think it's just visibility of fear because if it was just that, 
like you said, I mean, the product, the nudity question. I mean, some people are, are scared of that, you know, or they don't want to see that, you know, or disgusting, yeah, or whatever. But I think there is an anxiety also about the, politic, the politics that come with that, or what you imagine the politics may be with that kind of. Um, True, and feminists have, and this is this point, feminists share the same anxiety as right-wing politicians, and, and, this, is, and this, this is the real thing for me, I think, as feminists, we have to theorise theorize our way out of this very big dead end we're in. It doesn't suffice anymore to say that all women should um, go naked and look good and feel good, and that's liberation. Liberation could be veiling up, if I can just use that term. Um, you know, being counter-hegemonic and being subversive could be doing what Sarah Maple was doing. And I'd, I really encourage you to go onto her website and look again at those images. Um, it's, it's, it's really fantastic stuff. Well, I mean, in France it came from the feminists in terms of the... Uh, yeah, feminists are just as vociferously against the burqa yeah, as... Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's where it's... And also, yeah. and so, what I don't understand is why is male circumcision not part of this? Is it because it's hidden? Well, it apparently doesn't hurt, apparently. <laughs> Unlike female <laughs> circumcision. That's because they do it when they're babies or something. That's the argument I was always told. <laughs> Well, no, because these are selective politics. No, but what I meant was yeah. it is about, in a way, the control of populations within our borders, which is what you're saying. Yeah. You know, it's less about actual cultural practices. So yeah. it is fascinating for me, coming from India, that the British colonial state ended up sort of uh, focusing on matrilineal societies and making sure that matrilineal societies did not find place in the law, while Patrilineal, patrilineal um, multiple marriages within Islam were seen as valid cultural practices which they could not ban. So, you know, so we know that from history, so it's not just the anthropological but the historical that needs to be brought into play. True, and also the younger women, the younger women who have been brought up in parts of Europe, um, who are now the target of this legislation, they are, they are, they are they're starting to get together and they're starting to be powerful voices. So we'll see some interesting, hopefully, some interesting um, countermanding weights. But the shift is very much to the polarised right. Um, yeah. Ban the burqa and everything will be all right. Okay, thanks, don't, Maria. That's uh, yeah, for the camera, I don't mean that. I'm not being serious. <laughs> thanks again.